I'd really please introduce Peter Keogh, who is sitting over here from the Open University. Peter has worked for many, many years, no comment about his age, on in sexual health in the UK. Um, I don't know all of his history, but he worked for quite a number of years at Sigma Research, which was based in London, uh, different institutions, different yeah. um, which has done quite a lot of really important research with community organizations in sexual health, with LGBT and migrant communities. He worked at the University of Greenwich, but he's now at the University, at the Open University, and he's the lead, as you can see, and he's the lead for reproduction sexualities of the sexual health research group. I'm going to hand over to Peter, who's going to talk to us. The session ends at 11.30, so Peter will leave time for questions, I'm sure. So. <laughs> Over to Peter. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank much. you. Thank you very much. I'm really, really delighted to be speaking here today. Um, it's a kind of a combination of a lot of kind of toing and froing, um, cross border toing and froing, I think, between England and Scotland, between myself and England, about how impressive Irish is looking from uh, the perspective down south. Um, we are really um, in England, I think. Um, lacking these kind of forums, lacking this kind of criticality, and um, we're very, very interested in trying to reignite this kind of interest from a broad spectrum, um, given the situation that we're, which we're in at the moment, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about that, but just thank you very much for inviting me and just to say how really thrilled I am to be talking to you today. And today I want to talk about the ways in which we produce and deploy knowledge in the field of sexual and reproductive health. And I'd like to talk about how and why we produce very particular types of knowledge and the ways in which knowledge circulates within this field. So to start, I'd just like us to consider here in the room what we are here today. I mean, I guess we're here to listen to talks, ask questions, engage in discussion, on the coffee breaks and perhaps gossip in the pub later on. And in all of these things, what we're doing is producing and exchanging knowledge. Everyone here is, I hope, interested in learning today. So one way of characterizing what we're doing is creating within the Frenzy House in Edinburgh for one day a pedagogic space. This is our collective pedagogic space here. A space where we can produce knowledge, deploy knowledge, and circulate knowledge around sexual and reproductive health in Scotland. So as we create and inhabit this pedagogic space together today, I'd like to invite you to consider what forms of knowledge we're producing, what forms of knowledge we're exchanging, and what forms of knowledge and how we're deploying that knowledge. But I also want you to think about what forms of knowledge are missing. What could be here? What's not here? What political factors should be admissible in our pedagogical space? And what doesn't get entry? So in my talk today, I'm going to focus on a much larger pedagogic space, and that's the space of the university. And I, at a guess, I would say that everyone in this room has had some kind of encounter, good or bad, with the university. The university is a producer of research, teaching and training, and it's central to what we do as practitioners, our formation as professionals, our volunteers, or just as interested parties, are often shaped by what happens or what's produced by universities. Larger pedagogic space that I'm trying to And by this I mean the academic and professional space in which we conduct research and generate knowledge. It's also the space in which we teach, mentor, and support those working within the various branches of sexual and reproductive health. And I take a very broad view of this group who inhabit this pedagogic space. This group includes physicians, clinicians, allied health professions, public health practitioners, health promoters, people from the voluntary and community sector, activists, advocates, campaigners, and members of communities themselves. In short, I see this pedagogic space as currently or potentially being occupied by all of the people in this room and a lot of people who aren't in this room at present. Yeah. Do you need more slides? No, no, no. no. You're fine. Okay. Do, shall I tell you which slide? You'll have to. I will say next slide, please. Thank you very much. 
I want to you just raise your hand, actually. <laughs> Perfect. No, I could just test through it. I want to talk about the entire knowledge of just within that already circulating within this space and the types of knowledge that aren't here. Next slide, please. <laughs> I think this is a timely consideration because, as I see it, this pedagogic space is getting smaller. And I mean by this that we are producing less knowledge, and the knowledge we are producing and deploying within the space is becoming increasingly homogenized. We are not deploying a variety of forms of knowledge from a variety of sources, and I think this is a problem. So in my talk today, I want to first discuss some possible drivers of this narrowing, this homogenization, this bureaucratization of knowledge. I want to then explain in more detail why I think this is a problem for us. And finally, I want to su suggest some responses that we can think about collectively. So as you see there, um, as I said, although I talked about a narrowing and homogenization, I think that a more useful term to use when thinking about what is driving this narrowing in the, the pedagogic space is what many have referred to as the bureaucratization of knowledge, both within universities and across whole fields of practice, including sexual and reproductive health. Now, the bureaucratization of knowledge refers to the intensive governance of knowledge creation and the alignment of this knowledge creation to marketized and neoliberal imperatives. The broader global trend that's been identified in post-industrial societies, but I think it's supported by a more situated set of interrelated political discourses active in the UK in 2019. I'm referring here, of course, to austerity, a close relation with competitive free market capitalism in the knowledge market, which has been unleashed by Brexit. Recent years have seen the transformations in how knowledge is produced and deployed in British universities. Our research funding bodies have been reorganized and placed under a single umbrella agency, UK Research and Innovation. And although this is and probably does deliver synergies across disciplines and greater innovation in research, it also opens up these funding bodies to unprecedented scrutiny by central government and explicitly aligns them to the aims of the UK industrial strategy. And I'll just give you a quote from the key aim of the UK industrial strategy. The industrial strategy seeks to boost productivity by backing businesses to create good jobs and increase the earning power of people throughout the UK with investment in skills, industries and infrastructure. So this is an explicitly neoliberal and marketized version of social development and knowledge creation. You won't find in the industrial strategy much reference to things like inequality, communities, participation, empowerment, living standards, health, political emancipation, citizenship. These are the things, they're still there, but they're backgrounded, they're not foregrounded. So the, the industrial strategy also speaks to a free market nationalist agenda, which seeks to increase Britain's competitiveness on the international stage. Since the Brexit referendum, many of since Brexit, many of us working within universities have seen an increasing focus on quote Britain's competitiveness in the global marketplace, as evidenced by an increasing focus on our industrial strategy and indeed in the focus of relatively new research funding schemes such as the Global Challenge Research Fund, and indeed in the funding of educational interventions as part of our global development strategy, funded by, for example, DFID, the Department for International Development. So at home, we see a shift from what we might have called research funding, funded enlightenment model, that is research which throws lights on issues that are of concern to society, to research which explicitly supports businesses, industry, and market competitiveness. On an international level, as Britain leads the EU, we see a model of international research funding which is far less collaborative and global and far more national and, dare I say it, somewhat neo-imperialist. Our attention is less focused on how we can improve social conditions here and more about how we can exploit emerging markets and developing countries elsewhere. Similar trends can be seen in other areas of academic work. There is increasing scrutiny on what universities teach, how they teach, and how they engage with the world. 
We already have Research Excellence Framework, which is a centralized assessment of the quality of research that each university produces. But government has recently introduced the TEP, the Teaching Excellence Framework, and the KEP, the Knowledge Excellence Framework. Both of these are set up to assess universities on the quality of their teaching and of their knowledge exchange. However, with each of these, each of these consolidate the imperative and function of teaching as preparing people for employment, preparing people to compete in the marketplace and to increase their personal capital. And the broader role of the university is defined by the knowledge exchange framework now as primarily to engage with business around enterprise. The introduction of tuition fees in England some years ago has transformed the relationship between the learner and teacher. The learner is now a key paying customer of the services of the educator. And the recent establishment of the Office for Students enshrines this relation centrally. And we now see that student satisfaction takes equal priority to what students learn, the quality of the qualification they earn, their performance, etc. <coughs> by reconstructing the student as a consumer and the university as a producer, it assumes that knowledge is essentially a commodity with a market value. Learning becomes a form of shopping. This is a profound misrecognition of how learning and knowledge work. Knowledge is not poured into empty waiting minds. Knowledge is produced through the learning encounter. And in its more radical form, many pedagogical theorists would say that the knowledge which results from the interaction of student and teacher is something that is co-produced between them as they interact. So the student is as much a producer of knowledge as a, as a consumer. Okay, so many writers have written of this as the marketization of education, and we've seen it globally. Universities now are competing with each other for custom within a knowledge economy. Within this bureaucratization, and I will get to the point of sexual and reproductive health in a minute, within this bureaucratized and marketized economy, certain forms of knowledge emerge as having a higher value than others. In particular, knowledge that can be seen to create a measurable and preferably immediate impact takes on much greater value in the system. Knowledge which cannot so easily be described, which might have a more diffuse or longer term impact, or which cannot be so immediately transformative, becomes devalued. Thus, technical knowledge becomes preeminent across all academic domains and disciplines. A knowledge produced within the university needs to be, above all, useful, future-oriented, flexible, transferable. It must be designed to generate the biggest benefit from the minimum investment. And that's how markets work. Now, overlaying these broader developments in education generally are factors specific to public health. Next slide, please, Jim. Thank you. Good. Um, Unlike other social science disciplines, say socio-legal studies, educational studies, etc., health studies and public health straddle two very different epistemological traditions and approaches. On the one hand, to the left of that, of that uh, screen, or sorry, to the right, on the one hand, we have the softer social constructionist tradition, which focuses on things such as the social and environmental determinants of health, different conceptions and understandings of health, Health and social inequality, etc. On the other hand, on the left hand as you're looking at it, we have the harder biological or biomedical sciences, which attend to how pathogens behave in bodies and how treatments and drugs work. And somewhere in between these two, we have disciplines such as epidemiology, which examine how pathogens operate in populations or how different health outcomes are distributed across populations. And we also have the emerging uh, science of implementation science, which looks at how to implement um, complex health interventions across complex settings. Now, the ways in which these two traditions produce knowledge are very different. On the harder biolog biological or biomedical side, to the left, experimental designs predominate, with which I'm sure we're all familiar. So, the illness, the pathogen is identified, the drugs and the clinical procedures are developed that will remediate or cure the, the host person who's ill. These are trialed using experimental designs, such as the randomized control trial, and if shown to be effective, they're rolled out. 
On the other side, a range of social psychological, sociological, and social scientific approaches are employed to demonstrate social determinants of differential health outcomes. So, for example, social inequality or living conditions. In addition, this tradition will explore in more depth experiences and, experiences and responses to ill health in individuals and groups, and seek to explain how social and cultural factors exacerbate entrenched inequalities. Now, looking at this, we can describe the relationship between these two very different epistemological approaches as somewhat of a creative tension. <clears throat> When they work well together, I'm going to raise my hand a little bit so I don't go and speed up. So. Okay. When they work well together, and they often do, and they often do, marvelous things are done. And I want to give you some examples. The success of the teenage pregnancy strategy was the result of a combination of biomedical, social, cultural, and political forms of knowledge working in tandem around an urgent problem. Likewise, in my own field, the global U equals U campaign around treating HIV treatment as prevention has been hailed as a huge success, as a technological assemblage of biomedical, social, and political interventions. And most recently, here in Scotland, the success of the HPV vaccine, uh, HPV vaccines here in Scotland, could not have been achieved in the absence of socially oriented understandings and political commitments by stakeholders. However, in nearly every instance of this kind of uh, success, there are myriad similar interventions which have not been successful. And for these which have, retrenchment and disappointment are often kind of inevitable and depressing features. So we're finding certainly in England that we're losing the gains we made around teenage pregnancy. Our claims to be able to end the HIV epidemic by 2030 which seemed only a year ago to be maybe achievable, are now seriously in doubt. And I would argue that what is behind this process is progress, followed by retrenchment, and a troubling inability to sustain the progress we make, is due to an imbalance in our knowledge economy. In short, certain forms of knowledge and ways of knowing the world have taken predominance, and this is a problem. So, Go to the next slide and see the point. Mm -hmm. Oh no, back, back, back. Oh my god, no, 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 no. We'll get on to him in a minute. Okay. <laughs> so the difficulty is that the marketization and bureaucratization of knowledge production we are witnessing in universities and elsewhere at the moment. Actually, can you go back? Back, back, back. Three slides. That's it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> tends to favor that marketization of described tends to favor the promises of epistemological production based within the biomedical side of the spectrum to the left. This is because the forms of knowledge produced within this tradition offer us promise of an instant solution to a pressing problem through technical knowledge tools. So this kind of biomedical knowledge production thrives within a marketized model where investment in an intervention, a drug, for example, reaps exponential returns in terms of benefits. And in many areas of reproductive and sexual health, we are seeing the predominant approaches based with or emanating from biomedical traditions. However, again, problems emerge when we begin to interpret what are essentially social ones through this biomedical lens. In my own area of HIV has seen a rise not only in biomedical forms of knowledge, by which I mean new treatments and new applications of treatments, which have definitely revolutionized the experience of living with HIV, with the virus, and the global morbidity. And I can, I can say without fear of contradiction that HIV over the last 20 years has been, without qualification, a biological success story in which I think we can all rejoice. However, the rise of biomedicine has also seen the predominance of biomedical forms of knowledge production and biomedical ways of understanding the world, and it is this imbalance that's now causing problems. In the last two years, we've witnessed disappointment when the bioepidemiological behavioral interventions of test and treat, or PrEP, roll out and are not yielding the predicted reductions in HIV transmissions. 
And inevitably, when that happens, we turn to program knowledge or process evaluation to enlighten us on why our interventions are not working. And inevitably, program knowledge and process evaluation tells us that it's structural and political factors such as lack of resources, poverty, stigma, inequity, gender inequality. These are the barriers to the successful implementation of our interventions. Now, the biomedically inflected response to this information is to try and design technical interventions to circumvent these other factors. So we are now witnessing on a global scale, global anti-stigma campaigns, which seek to change attitudes and end discrimination. Now, the problem with all of this <clears throat> is that stigma, inequality, and poverty are entrenched social and political structures. They are, of course, barriers to the implementation of biomedical interventions, but that's not all, all they are. They are also the basis upon which societies organize themselves, upon which markets operate, and they can only be properly understood in these terms. In short, stigma, inequality, and poverty are not technical problems, but political ones. And as such, they require political rather than technical responses. So in order to tackle structural inequality, we need to get political. And it's to the question of politics that I turn in my final framing of this knowledge problem that, I, that I'm talking about. Here. And I would argue that the growth of technical forms of knowledge within marketized knowledge systems has the effect of rendering the political dimensions of the problem invisible to us. The more we engage with sexual and reproductive health as professional technocrats, the less able we are to engage with political and social justice dimensions of the problems we are faced with. In technological knowledge regime, poverty becomes redundant because it's unfeasible or unrealistic, by which is meant that we can't find a technical solution to poverty, therefore it becomes intractable. Somehow we stop engaging with it. Technological knowledge regimes attribute value only to responses that solve the problem. In our search for technical solution, we misrecognize what we're dealing with. Political problems like inequality, stigma, and poverty are not there to be solved. They're there to be struggled with. We don't solve them, we fight them. So I would argue that the knowledge landscape we operate, the pedagogical space of reproductive and sexual health, has, over a long period, been evacuated of forms of knowledge associated with political struggle, activism in the proper sense of the word, as well as knowledge that attends to the political realities and offers political solutions. And I want to make it clear that I'm not saying that universities should be left alone in ivory towers to project and create knowledge for knowledge's sake. I'm not saying that all knowledge created in the bureaucratized space is useless, far from it. I am totally all for marketized and technologized forms of knowledge. What I am questioning is why only certain types of knowledge predominate and only certain uses or needs are served by this knowledge. And I believe that universities should be, universe, should be usefully enmeshed within and totally useful to the societies and communities they serve. But to me, it's clear that universities are not producing the range of knowledge that practitioners and communities need to respond to the challenges that were posed with regard to reproductive and sexual health. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to show you some very upsetting slides. I mean, <laughs> can we move on to uh, the very upsetting? Yeah, the very upsetting. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but we have to face up to it. The global gag is one of the most significant contributors to sexual and reproductive across the globe. We cannot solve the global gag through a complex intervention. We need to resist <laughs> and challenge it. What types of knowledge do we need to do this? Next slide. At home, the usurpation or the occupation of feminist political mobilization by gender essentialism is a major obstacle to promoting the health of trans and gender non-binary people. Okay. There's no technical fix that will solve this. What types of knowledge do we need in order to mitigate the harmful effects of gender essentialism? 
cultural and religious differences pose an ongoing and significant challenge to educating our children about sex, intimacy, and relationships. This is despite an increasingly liberal government's response to this area. What are the forms of knowledge that will help us to resolve those differences, speak across differences, enable, and enable us to deliver comprehensive sexuality education to every child in the UK? And why abortion services are still, are still in question here. They continue to be contested in, in the mainland UK. This is, oh, sorry, go back. Oh, where's my abortion? It's oh, been aborted. It's been aborted. Okay. <laughs> I was, I was, so it's a slide about the 40 days watch on abortion clinics that's happening all over England for Lent. Um, yes, yeah. Um, so obviously, abortion is still an in, more and more contested in the UK, and in its flickably remains illegal in Northern Ireland after 50 years of legalisation here. Okay. Scotland. Yeah. yeah. What are the forms of knowledge needed for us to counter retrenchment around abortion in the UK and elsewhere? So next slide. So I have some questions, and it's taken me a long time to get to my questions. But basically my questions are, can the university produce better knowledge? How can the university, as a space where knowledge is produced, managed, and deployed, best support the broad field of practice that constitutes sexual and reproductive health? Work? And the second is, can we educate the university? What is the potential to transform how the university produces, manages, and deploys knowledge around sexual and reproductive health through opening up the pedagogical space of the university to different forms of knowledge? So, what are these forms of knowledge that I'm talking about? Well, I don't, I don't pretend to have a solution to this question, but I think I can point us in the right direction, or maybe some direction, through looking at two histories. The first is the history of work and activism in sexual and reproductive health, and the second is the history of radical pedagogies, the pedagogical approaches that have been used in universities in the past. In terms of history, we have a history in sexual reproductive health where people have taken the lead in countering institutional dominance of knowledge production, working within and outside knowledge regimes. Slide. Hope these slides work. No, ah, there's a motion. There we go. <laughs> there, there we go. Mm -hmm. Back to something much. Um, associated at various points with witchcraft, midwifery as a set of embodied communitarian and generational knowledge practices fought for and gained meaning within legal frameworks of knowledge and only much later within biomedical and clinical practice, changing that practice forever. Next slide. Safe abortions in the UK and USA came through women and men enacting embodied and effective knowledge around their own experiences and the experiences of others. Testimonial and embodied protest were central to the development of abortion as a medical and social in this country. Next slide. And embodied ch legal challenge also constituted a key part of challenging orthodoxy and contraceptive availability. This is a bunch of women uh, stepping off the train in Connolly Station in Dublin. And this is in the 1970s when condoms were legal. And the intervention that these women did was to take the train to Belfast across a border, a very, very contested border, uh, where condoms were legal. They bought the condoms and they every week bring back boxes and boxes of condoms into Dublin and challenge the authorities. This is how they got off the train every week uh, to, to arrest them. Um, so we see within this a kind of an active form of knowledge. We see a connection of women's sexual health and contraception to much broader health agendas and indeed political agendas. It's a very, for me, a very kind of interesting example. I would on Irish anyway. Mm -hmm. So abortion and contraception are made more widely and functionally available in large part because large groups of women and men recognize the link between reproductive control and gender equality. This, of course, was not biomedical or social orthodoxy at the time. 
and different forms of knowledge and enactments around knowledge were necessary to change this opportunity. All fair jobs. We see, next slide, we see a similar process, thanks, um, at work in the development of anti medicalization uh, discursive knowledge and lesbian and gay rights. Orthodox medical knowledge was, so, was shown to be at stake and to have a key role in the oppression of lesbians and gay men, and hence collective activist forms achieved the reframing of this knowledge within a broader social and political context. Hence, this was central to the emergence of lesbian and gay rights. So just go through the, just go through the next slide, and the slide after that. So there's just another example of this, as in one section is cured, and another example after this, in on sexuality is not sickness. And if we go on to the next slide, please. More recent examples include responses to HIV. Earlier, this is these the next three slides are all for Grand Fury, which was an art collective which was attached to ACT UP in the late 80s to mid 90s in the United States, but also operational here. Earlier HIV activists creatively and visually represented the links between HIV and greater structure and gender inequality. Thus, they created new forms of knowledge and new framings of the virus, which resisted either its reduction to a biomedical pathogen or indeed as a moral judgment of those who were at risk. This one, for example, says women don't get AIDS, they just die from it. What's there, in, 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 in abbreviated within that small poster, is a whole raft of stuff around how women are researched, talked about, produced through HIV. Basically, women were not researched in HIV. As a consequence, we're more likely to die. Let's go to the next one, thank you. This I find very interesting. Can you see HIV anywhere in that ad? Welcome to America, the only industrialized country besides South Africa without national health care. This is an HIV awareness raising ad. It doesn't ever mention HIV because it explicitly connects HIV with a lack of nationalized health care in the US. Want to try the next one then? This is another. These, these were all appearing on the sides of buses and subways and in airports at the time. Kissing doesn't kill, greed and indifference do. So it's shifting, shifting the epistemological lens from uh, gays and junkies who are irresponsible to irresponsible corporate greed cause, causing uh, and, and exacerbating these, these epidemics. So next slide, please. So what do these different forms of knowledge have in common? Well, they insist that the pathogen or the technology, HIV, abortion, is placed within its personal, social, political context. Ill health and disease is seen not only in itself, but as symptomatic of and only resolvable by broader structural and political change. They all require collective mobilization rather than or in addition to individual action. They don't just depend on, behave, depend on disseminating information or changing behavior, but rather on people and groups going through a transformative pedagogical encounter. Consciousness raising to bring very, very old fashioned term back into the room. Mobilize indeed effective and enacted knowledge for and they require pedagogical engagement and development of knowledge by everyone, not just the professionals. In order to take part in collective forms of action, <coughs> people need to be able to understand their own experience of sexual ill health and articulate this experience politically. So I just want to return very quickly to our knowledge continuum. Sorry, Jamie. Um, so what else do we need in this knowledge continuum? I'm just going to talk through this slide rather than read it out. You just click to the next one. Or I'll keep doing a lot of thinking. Mm -hmm. We first of all need to we need to increase our continue to increase our toolbox of knowledge production. We need political perspectives. We need knowledge that is based from political economists, and we need people who are politically active to contribute to this knowledge field. The next one. We need oh God, can you can read this. We need embodied and affective knowledge forms, and this you can't. The only way of doing that is to involve people in the teaching and learning encounter so that they produce the knowledge themselves through their experience. It's about doing qualitative research into people's experience of their health, but it's about more, much, much more. And um, next one, what else is on the, on the list? 
Whoa, like huge, hey. pedagogical. <laughs> <laughs> we need a massive pedagogical um, injection. We, we, we need to benefit from pedagog pedagogues, people who have done research into pedagogical approaches that are liberatory, transformative, not just, as I said, transparent bodies into minds. Next one. And we need expertise, by which I mean the transfer of ways of doing stuff from one field to another. And often that knowledge, so for example, how can um, uh, Occupy Wall Street activists, what can they tell us about methods that we could be using in encountering the political reality of sexual health as we are? I think that's the end of the new knowledge continuum. Try and try, see if there's anything else. There's no more. No, that's it. There's yeah. no more. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, let me just catch up with the stuff. Where does that leave us with the university, which is where I started from? If we're to take such forms of knowledge production seriously, we have to look at ourselves as institutions, and we need to learn from our own pedagogical history. My own university, the Open University, was established in 1969 after nearly 20 years of post war political struggle. We were established within the framework and response to alternative education movements that were current at that time. So the anti-university was a huge idea in circulation in the late 1960s, as was indeed the pedagogy of the oppressed, liberatory pedagogy coming out of various developing countries, specifically Brazil, Argentina, and um, West Africa. We were, of course, about traditional pedagogy and teaching, but we were also set up to make maximum use of communications technology to democratize learning and, in turn, enable people and communities to transform the conditions in which they live. This month, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary as a university, and we're thinking about how far we have strayed from our original aim, but also how far we've been forced away from our original aim by, I have to say, successive openly hostile governments. People love the Open University, governments hate the Open University. But nevertheless, we persist. History tells us that radical pedagogical movements have always emerged at the moment. And I would suggest that we are approaching such a moment in the UK. So we need to think about how we just produce and disseminate knowledge. We need to expand the range of encounters and formats available for the learning. We need to take seriously knowledge that emerges from political struggles, knowledge that is legitimated collectively and often generated through friction. I'm not suggesting something that replaces the kinds of neoliberal bureaucratized knowledge. I believe that's absolutely necessary. But I think we need something that is more born of questioning and negotiation and struggle. And this, after all, is in the best traditions of universities. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So you've given her time for questions. Oh, damn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I open it up to the floor? To comments or questions or disagree with Peter. Eric. Hey there, um, I'm Eric. I'm a researcher, but I also work in the third sector and I've worked in the for council as well in the sector of education. My one of the things that I do in my work is to try and actually move a lot of knowledge production or to share knowledge from non-university settings like in practice or in the sector. And that's something that I've been trying to do over the last five ten years. Um, how do we actually physically or logistically encourage more um, research on information? I don't like the word research because actually it sets people to yeah. research versus evaluation. How do we get people to generate, collect and share knowledge in a way that actually makes it easier so that they don't have to fight with, oh, I need to get it published, oh, I don't have the skill as a nurse to do this, oh, I'm only a CSW, I'm only a healthcare professional, I'm only a assistant. How do we actually do that? Yeah. <laughs> because, because quite right, I totally agree with you yeah. that university, I was monopolized mm -hmm. in some way how we understand, how we, in a, in a way, legitimize what is research, what is 
for the bus and what's not. Yeah. yeah. So how do you do that? That is the sixty-five million dollar question. It really is. Yeah. But what what I would see, I mean, the reason I refer to the OU at the end is because um, we we went through a year ago our latest convulsion, you know, where we were told we're going to shut down, and, you know, whatever, um, and it was totally unviable and crazy, crazy. And we've been kind of really, you know, soul searching ever since. And I think one of the things that we are really looking at is um, because we've got nothing to lose. What else? Um, oh God, I shouldn't say that. I'm sure my vice chancellor would be extremely concerned if I said that. So yeah, I don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a space in which we can we can open up our spaces within the academy to that for kind of production or of, of non hierarchized knowledge. Um, so, for example, we at the Open University make um, a lot of our um, resources available free online. Yeah, but they're usually that part of the course that we do that people might be really turned on by it, and it is trying to get people into formal learning. Actually, what we need to be looking at is how we give the best of our stuff for free, um, and how we work with communities in order to produce their own knowledge resources online through the open, through the open university. Um, so using the university as a conduit to challenge forms of hierarchical knowledge. Um, but this only speaks to kind of online encounters, which I can speak to, but that's what I do now. Um, I'm sure there are other physical spaces and encounters that we could be doing, both the university in partnership with communities to really are trying to produce this knowledge. But it takes time. Um, it doesn't, you know, it takes relationships to build over time. It's what I would kind of call embodied kind of capital and legacy. It takes all of you guys sitting in a room over, you know, meeting every now and then for years to start thinking about these things. That's why I'm, that's why I think networks like these are massive. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Other comments or questions? This is the point of your hat. Thank you, Andrew. I'm a Scottish law school. Not shoes at all. Actually, it's something about you said universities are not producing the knowledge practitioners need. And you're suggesting, I think, that the need for that knowledge can, is, it comes from activism or did come from activism. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you think that we're no longer activists because the universities are not producing the knowledge practitioners. Is it all tied up together? I think it is all tied up together, but I don't think it's because because the universities aren't producing the knowledge. I think it's because socially we are, um, as a field, even activism has been kind of marketized or aligned. Not mar it's not marketized, it's not about making money, but it's about technologies, it's about kind of, you know, results, outcomes. And so I think that, yes, I think that within our fields generally, we have lost. Um, our expertise around activist forms of knowledge and activist interventions, definitely. Um, and, so, and alongside that, the universities have been are being massively regulated in terms of the knowledge they're producing. And I think we could possibly work together to try and regain that. We could help each other. But I don't think it's because the universities stopped doing it, but yeah. yeah. Um, I'm Jamie from Glasgow Caledonian University. I thought that was really interesting, Peter. I think it's really so relevant for Iresh because that's kind of the point, of, or at least one of the things that we're trying to do. But from, from my perspective, one of the tensions for me is that being a kind of career academic, it's all about applying for those big grants. And those big grants are saying, you've got to do this issue. And so there's a tension between me putting in a grant for a half a million which is addressing a particular issue that the government has said that they want to prioritize and the funders are going to give you money to me actually wanting to work with um, a small group who have decided to do a piece of intervention work that they've seen as come from them as a grassroots activity that's a bit i'm stuck it's like where do, where do we do it at the moment there's a bit of sort of 
because if I don't bring in money, then my boss just says, well, that, okay, that's fine. So you've got shed loads of teaching yes. to do yeah. because we've got to pay for you somehow. And so there's a tension between getting those big grants and then being able to siphon off some time to do something which might be a little bit more, um, less fundamental and a little bit more exciting and a little bit more, yeah. you know, relevant. But yeah. so that's my, that's my tension at the moment is who's going to pay? It's going to pay. Yeah. 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 I think, well, it's, it, yeah, I agree. That is has a, a massive and horrible tension. Um, I mean, you know, we, for example, we've just been funded to um, do a, a massive, massive divot project, um, which is about you know, promoting sexual reproductive health rights around the world. Just started, announced by Penny Morton yesterday. Um, and we're doing all the kind of learning and education, etc. Strikes me that even though even though the kind of language we're speaking of is that kind of technologized what works, mm -hmm. actually the kind of knowledge that we're going to be looking for to, I don't know, to, you know, stop forced marriage within our, 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 our um, deliver safe abortion within refugee camps, it's not about what works, it's more about, it's, some, it's something else. Mm -hmm. Don't know what it is, but it's, it's got to do with that. Um, and I think we might actually be forced to start thinking about that when we move into stuff. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. I think we've averaged a bit of an impasse where the kind of notion of delivering interventions and that kind of very programmatic knowledge is at a bit of a crisis. Now, I would say that, wouldn't I? Because A, I've reached a stage where I'm probably just a bit older, a bit nearer retirement, but that's possibly the case. Um, um, and possibly also seniority with an institution where I can say, oh, this institution should do that, maybe. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think that it is about acting within the spaces that the university can provide um, and trying to open and make most use of those spaces. And finally, I think we need to break down the distinction between research and teaching. I think that's really, really key. I think we, the more we think about research into teachings, when we use the research in the teaching rather than seeing the teaching as a pedagogical encounter where knowledge is produced. Yeah. Um, if we can be, I think, more rounded academics, I think that we might make that work a bit better. I'm not, but I don't have the answer, absolutely. To that. I know. <laughs> okay. Hi. <laughs> I was thinking when you were saying at the start, kind of like what forms of knowledge are visible, I mean, are visible in different pedagogical spaces, like more kind of at a micro level, that the fact that we're talking about sexual reproductive health and that like research within it often, I like at least find myself that you have to edit yourself a lot and play a lot of respectability, and that really like shapes and limits the kind of conversations that you can have. And I think that. Think that a lot of the problems that we have and solutions that we can tackle are very much affected about the fact that often we need to justify that we can be professionals talking about this and we need to like justify the fact that we can have conversations around it without being thought of as like lesser or less capable or being like yeah yeah or being um, meshed with all that business you know and it's like yeah. the fact that we have to do these like distinctions and what we're doing our research and kind of like um, navigating all of those is also made me think a lot yeah. about kind of like what knowledge is what knowledge is inadmissible in this space and like how much that limits us. Yeah. Um, which is something that I initially thought we were going to talk a lot about, and then I realized we were going really like macro. <laughs> and I just thought I was doing the comment. Yeah, yeah. I think there are different spaces out there, and and, mm -hmm. and and we can create in these kind of forms the kind of space we we want. I think that's you know Irish. That's that's the function of that kind of defense. It's to kind of you know do stuff that's useful, but also perhaps do stuff that crosses the boundaries of that releases people a little bit, frees them up a little bit from those constraints that we just don't go for. We talk about. But fair comment. All fair comment. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that we bring this to a close and have a few minutes in between the next session. But can I invite you to thank Peter again for his excellent. So the next session is, uh, we've got four people presenting, but I'm going to suggest we take a five minute